25 years ago, I made a series of films about wine that saw me travel the world, building up into a history, which then became a book. Today, I thought I'd revisit it and cut it up into bite-sized chunks for you to view exclusively online. I hope you enjoy viewing them <laughs> as much as I enjoyed making them. The Medoc wasn't always the home of such luxury. In fact, it was described as a wild and lonely place, just villages nibbling away at the edges of a great forest. But the landlords loved it. The hunting was terrific. The farming was good. It was marshland punctuated with good gravel banks, which were good for farming. And there were just a few vineyards, rather good vineyards. All at once, about the year 1700, the names of three of what are still the world's most famous vineyards are heard for the first time. Lafitte, La Tour and Margot were described straight away as first growths. When their wine turned up on the London market, it fetched four times the price of standard Bordeaux. And in no time, a flood of money from merchants and lawyers came pouring into the wild and lonely Medoc in a fury of planting. They all chose the highest and most gravelly ground. The saying goes that the best vines can see the river, meaning that the modest looking hills along the river banks, that is the river Gironde beyond the trees, had the best drainage, hence the warmest soil, and produced the ripest, best flavored grapes. The most famous of all these early investors was the Marquis de Ségur, known as the Prince of Vines. At one time he owned Lafitte, La Tour and Mouton. One of those improbable but ineradicable folk tales says that one day at court, the king remarked on his sparkling buttons. They weren't really diamonds, were they? No, sir, replied Segur. They're much more precious. They are the stones from my vineyards. But why was this new kind of Bordeaux wine worth so much money? Was it just the stony soil? There's no simple answer except to say that you could really taste the care and the expense that were so profitably lavished on it. The new proprietors went to the lengths of buying new barrels every year instead of cleaning out old ones. They pruned their vines harder to maximize the flavor, not the crop. They kept their chez, the Bordeaux barn in which wine is kept, clean and hygienic. And though they didn't know why it was so important, they kept their barrels topped right up to the bunghole. Not until Pasteur's experiments 150 years later did anyone know why this is so important that oxygen is the first cause of spoiled wine. Today, wine lovers are really hooked up on authenticity. It's the big deal. It must be exactly what it says on the can, as it were. If you look back to the 18th century, though, you would be amazed at just how much cookery went on. And it was done right out in the open. They weren't trying to fool anybody. The lightness and purity, that lovely, easily digestible quality that we so much appreciate in Bordeaux today, simply didn't have enough kick for the English. In fact, it's sometimes quite hard to see just what one's ancestors really were looking for. The hard-drinking rakes and squires portrayed by Hogarth demanded that their claret be made up with stronger and darker wines. The best were fortified with excellent red hermitage from the Rhone. But the normal recipe for England consisted of adding a substantial dollop of cheap and inky Spanish wine. At least the growers recognized the distinctive qualities of their wines in their natural state. Eric de Rothschild is responsible for Chateau Lafitte. It can't be very often that even you taste a wine of one of these vintages, but when you do, what do they taste like? They... It's a, it's a very curious experience because you don't really know if you're tasting a wine or tasting a memory of a wine. They do taste like wine, but, but they taste, in fact, an incredibly delicate, and it, it brings things to your imagination. I mean, either it's a very old lady going through the vines, or it's a roof with, with its shingles off. It's, it's 
wine, but it's also, in fact, more uh, the idea which one imagines uh, uh, of what it's been through. But they are individuals, are they? I mean, they still. Are, they are definitely individuals. If you take uh, the 99, in fact, I mean, if you take the 99, and I'm going to be terribly snobbish, in fact, but I'm going to tell you that I actually prefer the 1799 to the 1797, in fact, that it is just a little bit better. And uh, it's just got a little more body. Curiously, there still is some tannin in it. You still, there's a sort of filet, in fact, just a sort of trait. Can one see of. the colour still? You can, you can see the colour. It's actually, it's a very, oh, very yes, light colour. It's got a good colour. It's a very light colour, in fact. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. it's uh, a sort of very deep rosé, pelure d'oignon, in fact, like that. Was it but dark red, do you think, when it was young? I'm sure it was very dark red. However many times I've been back to the Medoc, I'm still almost overawed by the grandeur of some of the building there. Money has allowed the Baudelaire to build some pretty pretentious chateau. Something about the heirloom quality of a vintage chateau wine has an appeal to the rich collector that he cannot resist. The same can be said of the chateau themselves. In the 19th century, it was largely Paris bankers who poured money into land, or more specifically, into its building. The neoclassical Chateau Margaux is the finest monument of this Medoc resurgence. Bordeaux defines itself in terms of money. It was fascinating to go into the Chamber of Commerce building in Bordeaux and to see the original document, the 1855 classification which is still, whether you like it or not, very, very much a part of the Bordeaux scene even today. In 1855, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, sitting at this desk, put his name to this historic document. It was really an inspired publicity stunt, aimed at the Paris International Exhibition that year. It simply consisted of a list of the 62 most important wine chateau of the Medoc, classified in five growths, according to their merit. Merit really meant the prices that the wine had fetched over the previous hundred years. It started, of course, with the first growths. And here they are, Chateau Lafitte, Chateau Margaux, Chateau de la Tour, and Chateau Aubriand. Although it's not in the Medoc, it's in the Grave. It was included because it was the founding father of the whole lot. The trouble is that once you write something down, everybody believes it, until it's altered. And this list remained unaltered for 118 years, regardless of changes of ownership. Only two chateaus still have the same owners as they did then. Changes of boundaries, changes of standards, and even properties giving up altogether. So this hierarchy of money and prestige of over 100 years ago still haunts Bordeaux as a cause of endless argument. Only one man has ever forced the authorities to change the list, the redoubtable Baron Philippe de Rothschild, and it took this full-blooded individual, the greatest promoter of Bordeaux since Arnaud de Pontac, 50 years to achieve the promotion of Mouton Rothschild to top rank. <laughs> 